Hey everybody, welcome to Always Bored, Never Boring. One of my favourite childhood memories of Christmas was every year getting the new Beano annual. No matter what else Santa was bringing for me, there would always be tucked away in the old Santa sack the latest Beano. Here we are now in 2019. Santa doesn't visit me anymore because I'm an old git and he's far too busy delivering iPads and smartphones to the kids. So... I have had to buy my own annual. I have bought the Blackstone Fortress annual. This is something I was very excited to pick up. And I'm going to say this up front. It's a pretty cool product. But throughout this video, I'm probably going to say numerous times, I'm a bit disappointed that dot, 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 or words to that effect. And that's um, something that has to be taken in relative terms, it's a little bit like being served up a really nice cake and being disappointed that it wasn't just a little bit bigger. Because, to be honest, I knew exactly what I was getting when I purchased this. Um, and even so, I do feel like it could have been a little bit more than what it is. Um, it is a 76-page uh, limp back book. It's not hardback. Um and I do feel like it could have been a little bit bigger and it could have been a hardback. I think I partly feel that way because at the same time I ordered this little beauty, the White Dwarf Apocrypha. And this is something that I'm going to be reviewing in another video. But this, this cost me £17, this cost me £12. So there is a difference in price, but this is... A bit more of a weighty tome it's 128 pages it's hardback it's got the spot gloss cover and this very much feels more like one of those christmas annuals i get much more of that nostalgic christmas vibe from this um i guess the other thing to bear in mind of course is that this is all recycled content from old white dwarfs um this does have a small amount of new content but yes a lot of it is recycled content um, if you've watched any of my previous Blackstone Fortress videos, you'll know that I have regularly done um, videos for White Dwarf Magazine when it has had Blackstone Fortress content. All of that content has been compiled in this annual. And then there are a few extra things as well. But really, the, the main thing is to have all that content in one place. If you've been collecting White Dwarfs throughout the year, this may not be such an exciting purchase for you apart from the fact it's got a few new bits. But if you have missed issues or you just want everything in one place for easy reference, uh, this is very much a worthwhile purchase and not going to break the bank at, um, the full retail price is 15 pounds, I believe, but yes, I paid 12. So we're going to take a look through it and we'll see what it's all about. Obviously we have Janus Drake on the cover there. We have the recycled box art. They really have got quite a lot of mileage out of that particular image. Um, I have looked through the whole magazine, the whole magazine. I have looked through the whole annual and I don't think it's got any new artwork, Blackstone Fortress artwork, which is a bit of a shame. Um, and indeed it doesn't have a lot of the things that you might associate with an annual. Um, I really think it, they had an opportunity here to put some new fiction in. Um, I said in a previous video I would have really liked them to have compiled a story so far with all of the fluff from all the various different booklets that have come with the expansions. It would have been really nice to have that all in one place in one sort of timeline section. Um, you know, festive word search, little comic strip showing Janus Drake trying to celebrate Christmas in the Blackstone Fortress. Um, being chased around by uh, spindle drones, hilarious japes ensuing, you know, all the stuff that you would normally get in an annual. But uh, yeah, little roll and move game in the center pages, cut out tokens to put on a cereal packet, all of that. But no, it's basically just your white dwarf content. So first up, we have our expanded hostile player rules. And just so you know, I'm not going to go into detail on any of this stuff that I have covered in previous videos. Um, I am going to put a list, a list, I'm going to, I'll put my teeth back in, try again. I am going to put a link in the video description to the Blackstone Fortress playlist here on my channel, um, where I have covered all of this White Dwarf content previously. So the expanded hostile player rules is 
if you are playing with one person controlling the enemies, um, it gives them a little bit more to do. One of the big complaints with the base game was that if you had someone playing as the hostile player, they were a bit more of a facilitator rather than a the player. They were basically just rolling dice and moving things around. This gives them some actual decisions, some actual agency. Um, I've never used them because I only play the game solo um, or co-op and I don't play it against a an enemy opponent. But they seem decent. They seem like decent rules. So those are reproduced as is. The next thing we have is this section on abominable intellect and it's designer's notes. Now, as far as I'm aware, this is new content. Um, I don't recall it being in a White Dwarf magazine. Um, if it wasn't a White Dwarf magazine, I definitely missed it because I've never read it before. Um, and yeah, it's it's one of the most interesting things in the book because it's designer's notes, a little bit of behind the scenes on what the designers were thinking when they came up with, in this case, the Abominable Intellect expansion. And it's kind of weird that those are the designer's notes they went with. Abominable Intellect is probably the weakest expansion for the game so far. Um, it's, the, it's the one that I've been most negative about. Um, and yet, um, that's the one that they chose to have designer's notes relating to. Um, and why didn't they have designer's notes about the whole game, the whole product line? I would have, you know, that would have been some really good content for an annual. Lots more of the um, interviews with the designers and what were their processes. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this stuff. It's mainly just saying why Abominable Intellect is worth picking up if you want more of a challenge. It's almost like an extended advertisement, really. But there are two things that are interesting. They talk about their objective with Blackstone Fortress, and they make it clear that their objective was to create a narrative dungeon adventure where you could have fun with your friends. It wasn't supposed to be a really intense challenge. They never meant it to be uh, something where you faced outrageously lethal obstacles that killed you every game. It was supposed to be something that you could just play through as a campaign, have some fun with your mates, um, and just watch the story unfold. So that's how they designed it. Um, and now they're kind of backpedaling a little bit and introducing uh, elements to make it a tougher challenge because they realize that as cool as the narrative is people also want challenge they want to feel like um, as well as exploring a story they're also winning in that story they have the agency to take control of the narrative and push it forwards because they have been successful and epic and awesome so that's a little interesting insight. The other thing is something that I, I'm well aware of, but for anybody who um, has ever doubted that Games Workshop is always and will always be first and foremost a miniatures company, no matter how gamey the games may be that they release, uh, these designer notes confirm it here because they talk about um, coming up with rules for new characters. And they openly say they start by looking at the miniature and then they base what that miniature can do, what that character can do, based on what the miniature does. Um, so the pose of the miniature, the kind of armaments the miniature has, it's all miniature first, rules afterwards. And that's something that I am well aware of. Um, I remember when Silver Tower came out, um, they didn't really make any secret about the fact that they created all those miniatures, and then a very clever designer had to make rules for all of those miniatures, and that's why um, there's the really cool uh, Skaven Assassin that actually has the ability to sort of mirror himself and, and trick people into following the wrong version of himself um, to, to make use of the fact there are two miniatures of him. Uh, but yeah, so that's, that's um, something of interest. You know, Games Workshop are still predominantly miniatures workshop, despite the fact they have produced some excellent games. The designer's notes continue, um, just talking about how different twists um, work and things like that. And then they have this little bit of bragging rights at the end where they said that in one particular game, they ended up killing 64 traitor guardsmen and a few other bits and bobs. Um, but it's very much um, talking about abominable intellect. And like I say, that is slightly odd. Um, there are other expansions I would have much rather heard about. I would have much rather... <laughs> 
heard the designers talking about the narrative and how they're unfolding the narrative and little um, secrets and hints about what's coming next. Uh, that sort of thing. It, it, to, to focus the designer notes on a small card pack uh, that seeks to uh, undo or rectify one of their original design decisions is unusual. But it is an interesting read, one of the most interesting bits. Next we have Precipice Awaits. Precipice Awaits is the content from White Dwarf Magazine. It's when you go back to Precipice, you have different locations where you can do things. So we're not going to talk about that in any great detail. Next, we have one page of new rules called Strike Force. This is supposed to be a way of running less than four explorers. It covers um, how to handle only having two or three explorers. It's pretty basic. Um, it doesn't really change much except for um, you get some extra dice. The dice that would be allocated to heroes you're not using become fate dice. You roll them at the start and they become extra dice that you have access to and based on the number of explorers in the game um, determines how, how many fate dice you have access to. Um, and that's to offset the fact that it's supposed to be more difficult with less heroes. It's very simple. Um, it's not anything that you couldn't have come up with yourself. And um, it has a balancing mechanism that isn't potentially isn't necessary, considering the game's already um, not a, a, a really intense challenge. And then we move into an army of one. This is again White Dwarf content, and it is the content that introduced our solitaire. Uh, and I have talked about this in a previous video. I am a little bit disappointed, ding, uh, because. They give you these rules for um, sending in an army of one. And then they give you one character who is supposed to be the army of one. And that is the only character. It would have been a great opportunity to introduce some extra characters. I mean, why didn't they just, you know, do some silly stuff. Have Sly Marbo or whatever. And, you know, in introduce some other characters who are really cool, legendary, tough guys. You know. Have a white dwarf character or something. Just go nuts. Introduce something else that you can just try out beyond the solitaire. I would have liked to have seen that. The other thing I would have liked to have seen, and uh, you may have noticed, they have just reproduced the cards in the annual. This annual, um, I wasn't expecting it to come with a separate card pack, um, but just in case anybody might have been thinking that was going to happen, it doesn't. You do not get any cards with the annual. You have to photocopy them out of the annual. Uh, which is a bit of a shame. If they were to sell these cards separately at some point, if a small card pack came out, I would definitely buy it um, because that's more convenient to me. Um, as it is, yeah, it's just... It's a shame that all of these cards, um, for all of the content, are just reproduced inside the annual. Next, we are into our retinue characters, and we have all the retinue characters that have previously been in White Dwarf, so we get... Um, the Ogryn twins, we get the um, Arco Flagellant, and we get the Orc. Um, it's worth noting that in the side quest rules, um, I really wanted them to clear up this one rule, and they haven't. There's a rule here that says, during the expedition, discovery cards cannot be drawn for any reason. And yet, on every single mission, um, we have a table where point 20 says um, the leader picks an explorer, that explorer draws a discovery card. And that's the same on every single one of these retinue adventures. There is something that allocates you a discovery card, despite the fact the rules clearly say you cannot have a discovery card for any reason. That was something I picked up in, in the magazines, and I really thought they would have clarified that. You know, Just an extra line saying, unless you roll on the table or just update the table so it doesn't include discovery cards. Whatever. It's a little bit disappointing. Ding! Not so disappointing and something that I immediately checked is in the White Dwarf magazine, the rules for Dorg the Wall Brogan were wrong. And when they reproduced his inspired side, they included his Shield Slam ability, but they didn't tell you how to access that Shield Slam ability. They have now updated that to show that um, it's an extra ability he has access to once he is inspired. So then we have all of the retinue stuff. 
Penitent 707 was only in December's issue of White Dwarf, so um, I only reviewed that a couple of days ago. And then, oh look, it's that picture of Janice Drake again. Like I say, you know, really getting some mileage out of that. And then we have like a little um, gallery of painted miniatures. Uh, this is quite cool because it's got all of the explorers, including the ones from the Escalation expansion, and it shows you what ship they're from. It's divided up by ships. So you've got the, the Ultimatum there, and then you've got a Long Haul of Gamma 3 down here, and so on. So that's quite cool. And we have our retinue characters. We have all of our servants of the Abyss, including these guys, if they don't look familiar to you. These guys actually appear in an exclusive mission at the end of the annual, which is one of the things that is going to make this annual more appealing to people who might already have all of the White Dwarf content. We shall look at that in a moment. Um, all the other stuff, there's the Amble, and all the Urgles holding hands, about to play British Bulldogs. Okay, and then we have Light in the Dark. Light in the Dark was the first White Dwarf content they produced for uh, Blackstone Fortress. And it actually was in uh, December 2018, I believe. And it's like a little prequel mission. You're supposed to play it before you actually play the main game in the actual base game. Um, it's uh, uh, Thaddeus and Vaughn, I believe, go into the, uh, the Blackstone Fortress. They have a little scuffle. It's a small mission, doesn't take very long to complete. And at the end of it, you get a card as a reward. If you got the White Dwarf magazine that had this content in it, you actually got a physical card. It's a bit of a shame that, again, what they've done here is just reproduce it in the magazine. You can photocopy it. Look, they give you, they give you permission. That's nice of them, isn't it? Uh, so yeah, again, if you didn't get that issue of the White Dwarf magazine, um, you won't have that physical card. Luckily, it doesn't need to be shuffled into a deck or anything. It's just a card you get at the end as a reward. We then go into a Deadly Lure. And this is, for me, the best White Dwarf content they've produced. It's a seven-part um, narrative campaign that uses the Amble. And uh, and actually, that's a, that's a good point. I should mention that on the back of this... It does say it requires a copy of Warhammer Quest Blacks and Fortress and expansions to play. And a lot of this content does use all of the different expansions. Most of the missions use um, the extra enemies from Escalation. Uh, Deadly Lure uses the Amble. So there's a lot of content in here. You can use proxies and things like that. But you're still going to be missing out on certain things. Like you do need um, the stat card for the Amble. So the more expansions you have for the game, the more useful this annual becomes, as you would expect. But yeah, Deadly Lure is the best thing for me that they've done in White Dwarf. It's a very cool narrative. It follows um, this story through of where you have to uh, lure the Amble into a certain place because it's the only thing that can burrow into a sealed chamber. And um, I'm not going to... I'm going to skip without sort of giving that away because there's seven stages of it. It's quite good. Well worth um, getting if you don't already have the White Dwarf issues. And then we are into our new campaign, Wrath of the Demonkin. And this is where the Master of Possession and the, uh, the Greater Possessed come in. This is, to be fair, a little bit disappointing. Ding! For a number of reasons. Um, first of all, it's not very um, in-depth. It's basically three strongholds strung together. Uh, you And each stronghold has an access chamber. Um, if you decide to do this, this is um, it's not a side quest. It's a main quest, so it takes place between other quests. So um, they do recommend that you finish um, your base game first. Um, but once you start this quest, you basically go to the first stronghold if you complete that stronghold you can go to the second stronghold and if you complete that one you can go to the third stronghold and if you complete that one you've won the quest but there's no um there's no timer 
so there's no sense of uh, running out of time. You don't use any of the uh, the timer mechanisms from the base game or the expansion. The only way to fail is if you have fewer than four explorers at the start of an expedition. Chances of that happening, pretty remote, especially if you've got the, uh, the escalation expansion. I can't imagine you would ever... Um, have fewer than four characters especially when you think back to those designer notes which said they really weren't intending people to die very often anyway so it's not really something that has any great sense of urgency it doesn't it doesn't really fit into the overall narrative of the blackstone fortress it's more chaos entities that are there uh, so it's it's just another way of showing that the Blackstone Fortress is drawing in all of this interest from chaos. I think um, we are building towards something suitably huge um, and the Blackstone Fortress perhaps being used for a chaos incursion in the main 40k storyline um, because they have really doubled down and, and gone in heavy with um, the number of chaos entities that have been lured here for various different reasons. And this is another one that the... the uh, the master of possession uh but yeah so you play through the three expeditions um i'm not going to show them uh on this video because um it's not really spoilers you have to read and set them up before you uh before you can play them but i think it's probably something you'd want to want to see yourself firsthand it is also slightly disappointing ding how many is that now that um again because you don't get cards for the enemies once you have completed this campaign there's a fudge for introducing these enemies into your main base game it works on the basis that um whenever you draw a card with a rogue psyker you roll the dice and if you roll a 15 plus then you replace one of the rogue psychers with a master of possession and if you draw an encounter card that has Chaos Space Marines on it, you roll a 15 plus. Um, and if you succeed, you can replace up to two Chaos Space Marines with um, Greater Possessed. I guess another way to do it might be um, if you're in one of those situations where you have to spawn more enemies of a certain type than you have, then you can bring in the, the relevant upgrade. So if you don't have enough psychers to fill out your spawns you could use uh, a master of possession that's an alternative way of doing it if you don't want to keep rolling dice but yeah it's a little bit disappointing that it's a little fudge rather than having some encounter cards but of course obviously no encounter cards included um and you can't really it's it's not easy to photocopy encounter cards and then put them into a shuffle them into an encounter deck because you have to try and find a suitable card you have to sleeve them up so to disguise them amongst the official cards so I, I get why they've done it at least they have included a method of including these enemies in your base game and in your other games they could just not have bothered so it's okay it's all right um the next three pages are the various different strongholds and then we get to the last content, which is the information on our uh, Master of Possession with his stat card. And then on the back, the Greater Possessed stat cards. And this is something that is a little bit disappointing. Because we have our Greater Possessed on this side and we have on this side... Um, Sorry, we have our Master of Possession on this side, and on this side we have our Greater Possessed. I know at least one person who is planning on buying this book to cut the, uh, cut it up and use the pages. It really wouldn't have killed them to have included uh, a blank page on the back of these, just for those people who did want to cut it up. Um, it's a bit of a, an inconvenience. But obviously most people are going to photocopy it. Um... So let's have a quick look at what these guys do, um, and then we will wrap up. So first of all, we have our Master of Possession. He has a move of two, he has ten wounds, he is huge. He has a force stave and a bolt pistol, which makes him pretty, pretty rad at range one, and then not so rad 
as we move outwards. He has the ability Demon Kin, so every time he takes a wound or a Grievous Wound, you roll the dice, and on a 17 plus, it is negated. He's also a Master Psyker. When the Master of Possession is activated, he takes two actions, one after the other. Um, we have his um, activation chart here, and he has a few extra abilities. He has Disrupt and Rights of Possession. They're very similar. In fact, almost identical. Um, the way it works is um, when you use these abilities, one unspent activation or destiny dies chosen by the hostile player or the leader is discarded and cannot be spent that turn. And then if there are no unspent activations or destiny dice available, um, if you've done disrupt, then one explorer has to take a wound. And if it's a right of possession, one explorer has to take a grievous wound. He also has the warp fire braziers. Um, all adjacent explorers suffer one grievous wound. So that's our Master of Possession. And then we have our stats for the Greater Possessed. They've um, weirdly reversed the uh, the card on this one. Don't know why. Um, and the way it works, we've got um, Greater Possessed are move 3, 12 wounds, size huge. They attack with their demonic mutations. You do not want to get someone's demonic mutations all over you. That's gross. Um, obviously quite brutal in close combat rolling 2d12. They have the demon kin ability as well. So on a 17 plus they can negate a grievous wound or regular wound. And then they have their, um, they have a very limited range of, of abilities, behaviors. They mainly just run at you screaming and then hit you with their demonic -y bits. They have the ability warp surge. So you can remove a wound counter from the greater possessed. If the greater possessed does not have a wound counter, treat this result as a charge instead. They can rush, so they move towards the closest explorer, then take a charge action, and they have Fury, so they take the Onslaught action, but can re-roll failed attack rolls. And that's it. Not the most exciting, basically just a hard-hitting um, Juggernaut. Something that's going to run at you and, and just try and slam you. And that is it. I am a little bit disappointed that... To the best of my knowledge, at the moment, the Master of Possession and the new Greater Possessed miniatures, they were in the the battle box that came out a little while back. I believe it was called Shadow Spear, um, but I'm a bit terrible at remembering the names of all those battle boxes because they usually have ridiculously over-the-top names that, that also all sound a little bit... Um, the same. But uh, Shadow... I think it was Shadow Spear. Um, and then they were subsequently made available in a start collecting box um, along with a bunch of Chaos Warriors and um, a, a big walker robot thingy and some obliterators, I believe. So at the moment, if you want to get these guys, if you're not prepared to hunt around for them individually on eBay or proxy them, then you either have to have Shadow Spear or you have to buy the start collecting box. That's fine. Um, but if you've got it by the start collecting box, I really would have liked them to have leaned into that a little more and included some more fleshed out rules for Chaos Space Marines. This is something that I said a little while back in another video that I really would like the Chaos Space Marines to be more than what they are. You get two Chaos Space Marines in the base game and they're just big dudes with bolters. The start collecting box that these greater possessed and the master of possession come from um you get a full squad of chaos space marines with all their different weapons they've got their their combinations of of melee weapons and ranged weapons they've got their special weapons and i think it would have been interesting to include a new chaos space marine card that allowed you to generate larger quantities of marines um and introduce their special weapons and something else for the the explorers to think about i think they missed a trick there and i think that's kind of how i feel about a lot of this annual i do feel that it has perhaps missed a few tricks um it's a great product uh for people who love blackstone fortress like i do uh it combines all that content that people may have missed anybody coming in late to blackstone fortress and has missed a year's worth of White Dwarf magazines, um, they will know how difficult it is to hunt down some of those issues of White Dwarf, and you sometimes have to get the PDFs and things like that, and it's a bit of a pain. This 
book resolves that issue and that's great and it does have new content and it has a new mission and the the new mission isn't a bad mission the new mission it's it's a little bit throwaway i guess but it introduces some new enemies it's got um a new narrative to play through it's got new um strongholds which have their own um special rules so it is a full it's a full mission it's an extra mission um so for your 12 pounds for another three plays say another three expeditions um another three strongholds um a couple of new enemies to face that's probably worth it anyway isn't it but yeah it, i just i would have liked it if they could have I think if they'd have gone in a little heavier with it, if they'd have included a little bit more, um, if they'd have fleshed out some of the concepts that they'd introduced in White Dwarf, um, they could have introduced some new areas for Precipice, they could have introduced a couple of extra retinue characters, some more solo characters. Uh, there's lots of things they could have done. And like I say, new, new little bits of fiction, stuff that would have made it feel more like, more like an annual. It's not the Beano, is it? But there we go. That's it, really. Overall, I am happy with this purchase. I am happy with this product. Um, it saves me having to cut up um, White Dwarf magazines. Like I say, if a card pack comes out that works in conjunction with this annual, I will definitely buy it because um, photocopying and pasting up is a nuisance. It's a pain. But that's it. I guess I don't have anything else to say. And I think a lot of people would say I've probably said too much already. So thank you very much for listening to me, if you are still listening to me at this point. If you have liked the video, please consider pressing that like button. If you have really liked the video, please consider subscribing if you don't already do so. And hopefully, I will see you all again very soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.